as another proof of the excellence of the climate and health of the inhabitants. The author states that the figure of a girl of 15 in St. Helena is that of a mother at 30 anywhere else. It is for the most superficial reader to say whether a stronger proof of the deleterious effect of a climate on the human frame could well be cited. It is also worth while comparing the author's description of the abundance of beautiful pasture, a country most beautifully fertile for miles on every side, thickly studded with highly cultivated farms, views almost unequaled for boldness of scenery, richness of foliage, verdure, cultivation, well-stocked farms, with what this rival of his prototype, Oliver Cleveland, discloses in page 93 fees. The price of every article of consumption is at least 300% dearer than in England. And as far as provisions are concerned, 500% dearer than in India. In Madras, a sheep will cost about half a crown. In St. Helena, the price of a consumptive duck is 10 shillings. And afterwards, that a captain in the Navy, while on this irksome station where neither credit nor profit can accrue to him, should be obliged to consolidate half a week's income in the purchase of a roasted turkey and couple of boiled fowls. The above palpable proofs of this writer's bare-faced inconsistencies remind me of the sophisticated remarks containing in page 53 of his facts, wherein he states that it must have been a very highly favored general of great interest and personal connection with the continental crown has, who would, in addition to such a retreat, have received from his king a stipend of little less than 20,000 pounds per annum to maintain an establishment. Although this may appear somewhat plausible at first sight, let us dispassionately examine the question, is not Napoleon son-in-law to the emperor of Austria? And is he not related by ties of co-sanguinity to almost all the sovereigns of Europe, amongst others to his royal highness, the prince regent of England? As to the stipend of 20,000 pounds per annum from the author's own admission, the price of every article of consumption is at least 300% dearer than in England. That stipend, which he thinks so liberal, is reduced to 6,700 pounds per annum. In page 87, the author states that since Bonaparte's detention, the East India Company have established stores, whence the military and others are supplied with all articles of English and Indian produce at a moderate rate. This is also a misrepresentation, as the stores in question were established long before Napoleon was born. In page 91, he states that the price of every article of life in the island is exorbitant. In page 80, he also asserts the inhabitants of the country, i.e. St. Helena, are in general greatly benefited by the arrival of the detinues, troops, CTC. It is an undeniable fact that the residence of Napoleon on the island has caused incalculable mischief to the East India Company and to the greatest part of the inhabitants, besides costing about 500,000 pounds sterling, if not more annually, to the English nation to defray the expenses incurred for the maintenance of the garrison, a numerous staff, uh, 74, and a large naval squadron, the enormous cost of transport, wear and tear of ships, and Napoleon's household, not forgetting the many new places created, and sinecures enjoyed by favorites, amongst others, two situations amounting to about 1,800 pounds annually by Sir Thomas Reed, who is Deputy Adjutant General and Inspector of Police, and that the Lieutenant Colonel Leicester of about 1,000 pounds, Mr. Baxter and Lieutenant Colonel Winyard, about 1,000 pounds each. I should but ill discharge my duty to the public were I to omit observing that Brigadier General Sir George Bingham, second in command and Lieutenant Colonel of the 53rd Regiment, only received about 1,400 pounds per annum, while Sir Thomas Reed, a captain in the 27th Regiment, enjoys salaries amounting to 1,800 pounds per annum, besides other advantages. Had the remarks contained in page 95 on the dearness and scarcity of provisions with the extreme extreme hardship of obliging naval officers to exist on their ordinary pay, while that of the army is nearly doubled, originated 
in any other source than the author of these facts, it is reasonable to hope they would have excited that degree of attention to which they are so justly entitled. Strange as it may appear, I perfectly coincide with the writer on the above interesting subject and by way of an attempt to obtain a little credit for the modern Munchausen, I am induced to add this singular fact, a young gentleman named Wardle, a midshipman in His Majesty's ship Raccoon, who was in 1817 gazetted to an Isinci in the 66th Regiment, quartered at St. Helena upon disembarking to join that corps, was in the receipt of as much pay as the captain of the ship from which he had just been discharged, and that according to the St. Helena regulations, an army lieutenant of seven years standing receives more pay in one month than the lieutenant of the Navy's quarterly bill for three months. It is necessary to state that the army enjoy the same advantages in procuring stock and provisions from the Cape of Good Hope as are granted to the Navy, a certain portion of tonnage being allotted in the store ships and transports to the former, equivalent to that of the Navy. Although I have no longer the honor of belonging to the naval service, I do not on that account feel less zealously attached to the real interests of my country, interests which can never be so well consulted or securely maintained as in cherishing and rewarding the only legitimate and by far the most powerful source of our national greatness, wealth and prosperity.' 